The Euclidean submarine with Captain Bradford, Mrs. Gregory, and Jerry and Joan on board is nearly into the channel off Los Angeles Harbor. The time is late afternoon. Captain Bradford is working frantically to get a radio message to Johnson at their home radio station. The other Euclidean submarine hangs on close behind them, holding back the faster boat and maintaining their own position by means of a magnetic beam. Joan stands ready to handle any emergency that may arise, and the captain continues to call the Gregory home station. J-12C. J-24Y. J-12C. <clears throat> Hello, J-12C. Hello, Johnson. J-24Y to J-12C. Hello, J-12C. Come in, J-12C. Hello. Well, that seems to be that. No, it doesn't look very good, does it, Tex? Not yet. We'll have to raise Johnson soon, or we'll be in the harbor and that other boat right with us. But we don't dare go in the harbor with our other boat after us. No, Jerry. We can't go into the harbor with this submarine, much less with another following. I think we may safely avoid that. How? Simply by cruising around near the harbor until you locate Johnson. That's about all we can do. Have we plenty of fuel for that, Joan? We have more than enough fuel to cruise all night at this speed. Well, it'd be better for us after dark and better for Johnson to try to rescue us. Yes, if we can raise him at all. I think you are too impatient, Captain Bradford. Joan, dear, Tex has been trying for nearly an hour and not a sound from Johnson. That is easily explained, is it not? When we last heard from Johnson, he warned us that his plans were in danger. And almost simultaneously, we heard the voice of Thales, chief electrician of Euclidia. Then, no more of Johnson. That's what I'm worrying about. What did that fellow Thales do to Johnson? Well, they sure spoiled Johnson's radio set. We know that. And it would take some time to repair or replace that radio set, would it not? But, Joan, why doesn't Johnson get to another set somewhere and start calling us again? You say you're sure Thales wouldn't hurt Johnson any. It is not reasonable to think that he would harm the one man who is the connecting link with Captain Bradford. Then, if Johnson is unharmed, as you believe, I agree with Jerry's question. Why doesn't Johnson get to another radio set and let us know what he's doing? Well, I know one answer to that. Johnson is probably sure that we were getting his message at the time Thales interrupted it. And he will figure that Thales will be watching for another call from us. It might sound reasonable from Johnson's point of view that he could do us more harm than good by calling and forcing us to answer him. I quite agree with you, Captain. Well, so do I. But I don't see where that helps us very much. Isn't there some way we could send a message to Johnson Telling him something more of our situation than he can possibly guess. Boy, now it'd be a swell time to use those homing pigeons. Yes, wouldn't it? But old G-47 has them safely hidden away on the island. There is nothing to be gained by speculating on the impossible. Can't you try to get Johnson to answer you, Tex? I've been doing that for over an hour. Well, I mean, try to tell him in code that we'll be floating around loose in the water off San Pedro after dark tonight. That should get some kind of an answer out of it. It would also let the Euclidians know a great deal about our plan. Now listen, Joan. Just listen to me for a minute. You're scared to death of old G-47 and the rest of the Euclidians on the Magic Island. Oh, I'm not saying they can't do plenty of tricks, but we may just as well be prisoners back on the island if we've got to run around the bottom of the ocean in a submarine for the rest of our lives. And I feel very much the same way, Jerry. We took a chance when we even set out to look for that island, and we've taken many chances in escaping twice. And I can't think of anything that would make the Euclidians more angry than stealing this submarine. Well, after we've gone that far, and now that we're within an hour's run of Los Angeles, I think it's time to take one more big chance and tell Johnson to answer us. Well, you were the boss, Pat. This was your party when we started out. You believed you'd find Joan, and you were right in that. You think this is the time to press our luck? Here we go. I am heartily in accord with your wishes. I will operate the microphone and the directional beam for you, Captain. All right, I'll try Wilmington. Uh, will you set your beam, Joan? I'm doing so now. I wish just once we could ask you to do something and you'd not find you already having it half done. On Euclidia, we are taught to think very rapidly. Well, don't forget it. It might come in mighty handy before this night's over. Captain Bradford. Uh, yes, Joan? Before you make another attempt to contact Johnson, I should like to make a suggestion. Go to it. We will use our magnetic bombs to hold the other submarine powerless while we escape from this one. Yes, we understand that, Joan. Then it is absolutely necessary that Johnson come out to rescue us in a boat made entirely of non-metallic materials. That's right. And if he doesn't, well, he'll get magnetized along with the rest of us. And he'll be in it just as bad as we are. But, Joan, you said that the magnetic beam from the other submarine would draw the bombs to them. And that we wouldn't be affected by them. That is true. We will not be affected by magnets from the other submarines. Then where can the magnetism come from that would harm Johnson's boat? 
You have forgotten the plane flying over us. Golly, Whiskers. Oh, Tex, that plane. I sure forgot it for the minute. But we don't see the shadow on the water now. Oh, are you sure it's still following us? Positive. I don't see the shadow. The sun is now much lower. The plane is undoubtedly directly over us. But its shadow is a great distance, probably several hundred feet ahead of us. You think the plane is still right over us? You may believe that I know that, Captain. The Euclidean plane is directly over us. But well, he can't see us in the water, can he? Easily. His prism reflectors will pierce a far greater depth of water than we now maintain. That's not so good. He can always drop some of those magnetic bombs and anchor any boat Johnson brings out. Even a wooden one with a small motor. Precisely. But after dark, what good will his reflectors do then? Then he will depend on his magnetic compass. The beam from the submarine holding fast the stern of this boat naturally ends at this boat. Even an ordinary compass in an ordinary airplane would show whether the pilot was over the end of that beam. Then, then that plane will be flying over us, even when Johnson comes out to rescue us tonight. Afraid so, Pat. But what will he do to us? We will come to no harm if we escape the magnetism. I have explained that Violus has no place with the Euclidean. Oh, I hope you're right. Me too. Well, right or wrong, we're going to have to take a chance on it. Now, everybody keep quiet. I'll see what I can do with this radio. Uh, ready, Joan? Three meters. Three meters. Ready, Captain. J24Y to J12C. J24Y to J12C. Get this, J12C. Answer at once. J12C. Answer J24Y at once. Regardless of reason for your silence. Answer at once. J24Y calling J12C. Answer at once. He may not even be hearing you. Oh, keep trying, Tex. We've got to raise him very soon. Or it'll be too late. Right, Pat. Joan, we may need more than one wavelength. There's no way of knowing what sort of set, if any, Johnson has now. Uh, will you try various bands? Change the set over after I complete each call and wait a few seconds for an answer? I will make the changes, Captain. Ready? Ready. J24Y to J12C. J24Y to J12C. Answer at once, J-12C. J-24Y to J-12C. J-24Y to J-12C. Answer at once, J-12C. J-24Y to J-12C. J-24Y to J-12C. Answer at once, J-12C. It's John. Oh, Texas, it is. Silence. J-24Y to J-12C. Get every word of this. May not be able to repeat. Using only three-fourths of our power. Ready. Copy. Remember. The wooden vessel. When you bring formula to the... Fusing point, greatest danger, intermediate point, when you see one, ingredient, precipitate, holy black, move fast, limited time. That's all. No questions. J24Y to J12C. That's all. J12C. J24Y. Got your message. Will follow instructions. Will have formula completed when you call for it. That is all. J12C. Well, he got it. Every word of it. Did you actually send Johnson a code message then, Captain? I certainly did. A little slow about it as I had to figure it out and jot it down as I went along, but... He got it. That's more than I did. You sure think fast, Tex. I told you, Joan. Tex and Johnson are the two finest men in the world on extemporaneous code messages. A few months ago, I would have questioned that, as the Euclidians claim they are the finest. But now, I believe you. Well, I didn't get anything out of it. All I got was a 3-4. Careful, Pat. Uh, Joan, is it safe to talk now? Perfectly safe, Captain. I have insulated us against all possible communication. All right, then here's the message. Now, look. I told Johnson we were using... Only 
three-fourths of our power. And that means the third and fourth words in the message. That's right, Pat. You're not so slow yourself. And here's the message. Now, I'll read it all. Then just the third and fourth words. Remember the wooden vessel when you bring formula to the fusing point. Greatest danger, intermediate point, when you see one ingredient precipitate. Holy black, move fast, limited time. Now, did you get it? Not me. You concealed it well, Captain. What is the message? Well, now watch. Now I'll cross out every first and second word and read what's left. Wooden vessel, bring formula, fusing point, intermediate point, C1, holy black, limited time. I got it. Johnson's going to meet us halfway with a wooden boat as soon as it gets dark. Oh, splendid work, Tex. It is indeed excellent, Captain Bradford. But I fail to understand the appointed place. Well, intermediate point means halfway. And C1 means our old pigeon training course. Course number one to Catalina. Oh, that covers it, Tex. Johnson will be prepared to meet us with a sailboat. Halfway to Catalina, on our old training course, as soon as it's completely dark. That's it, Pat. I don't see how it can miss. Oh, it, it seems almost too much. We're within a few minutes of the harbor, and Johnson will be out to meet us. And in a few hours, it'll be all over. Remember that it is still daylight, and we have several hours before the appointed time. That's a swell thing to bring up, just when I was feeling good. We've got to chase around for hours with that other sub hanging on our tail. Yes, I had nearly forgotten that. No, I hadn't, but it doesn't matter one way or the other. We're in no danger from that boat now. What was that? I didn't notice anything. Neither did I. Silence. I heard it then, all right. That is another musical note from Euclidia. Octavo is near our keynote with his beam. We must put on emergency speed and try to shake off that beam. You mean they're finding us with one of those destructive musical notes? I thought I felt the submarine shake. You did. Our only hope lies in changing our position constantly until after dark. If that note finds us squarely, Johnson will never find us. Just outside the entrance to the Los Angeles Harbor at San Pedro, a strange adventure is nearing a climax. The stolen Euclidean submarine with the Gregory party on board is racing across the Catalina Island Channel. And another Euclidean submarine, filled with scientists from the Magic Island, is hanging grimly to the Gregory boat by means of a magnetic beam. Joan is at the controls as total darkness covers the channel. The time draws near for their attempt to escape from the submarine. Hey, Joan, we're picking up a little speed. We do seem to be moving faster, Jerry. Why is that, Joan? It is barely possible that the magnetic beam of the following submarine is weakening slightly. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. They've used that thing continuously for seven hours. Uh, how about our getting the magnetic bombs back to them if that beam gets too weak? Do not worry about that, Captain Bradford. The magnetic bombs will follow a line of electrical impulse no matter how weak then we are absolutely sure we can hold that boat helpless and we're ready to escape from this one. Yes, Mother. Uh, what's our position now, Joan? We are nearly to the point you have established for Johnson to meet us with his sailboat, Captain. Uh, how near? We will reach the midway point between the breakwater and Catalina Island in less than 120 seconds. Two minutes? Boy, let's do something about getting ready. Yes, Joan, you haven't explained those escape chambers we're going to use. The explanation is very simple. Jerry, will you please open one of those four large cylinders just forward of this compartment? You mean we're going to get inside those little tanks? Precisely. The covers are not locked. They will swing open easily. Oh, okay, if you say so. Now, Mother, if you and the captain will step over there near Jerry, I will make the explanation from here, as I must remain at the controls to stabilize our boat and release the magnetic bombs the instant we are in position. Very well, Joan. Uh, come on, Pat. I'm a little nervous, Tex. This is getting very near the end of our journey. Only the beginning of Magic Island, though. Wait till we go back and with some help and take the island away from old G-47. It would be well to get out of here first, if you will allow me to explain these escape cells. Go to it, Joan, and keep still, Jerry. I'm still. One moment. All hold firmly to your stations and must now release the magnetic bombs. I think two would prove sufficient. However, I will use four to guarantee our safety. Is that all there is to it, Joan? That is all. The bombs have been released. In a few seconds, that magnetic beam will be broken. Then we can make our escape from this boat. Hey! What's going on here? We're being tossed around. I will take care of that. 
Well, I'm sure it traveled half a mile and nothing flat. Gee, did you ever hear so much quiet so quick? You cannot hear quiet, Jerry. <laughs> Maybe not, Joan, but that silence was certainly sudden. What happened, Joan, dear? The moment we were released from that magnetic beam, our submarine started to spurt forward, and not wishing to run beyond the position of our meeting with Johnson's surface boat, I used all reverse jets. We are now stationary and will remain stabilized at this point. Is Johnson due over us now? Right this minute. Oh, then let's hurry and get up to him. I'd like to try being on top of the water for a while. I will now explain the escape cell. Joan, is it safe for you to leave the controls? The submarine will not move from this spot. Sure got these boats trained. I told you to open these cells, Jerry. Oh, I got excited and forgot it, I guess. You just lift these covers off, Joan? They will not lift off. Open them toward the shell of the submarine in this manner. Each of you open your own. There's mine. Mine's open. And there is mine. Now we will need to work very rapidly. No one knows how great a margin of time we may have before the Euclidians find a way to interfere. Oh, well, we're listening. We must all take our places in these cells at once. If you watch me enter this one, you may all duplicate the action. Place your foot here. Then step up here. Raise your weight by these holes on the shell, so... And lower your body into the cylinder, as I am doing. This is the final position. Well, it's slightly more acrobatic than anything I've attempted for some time. But I think I can make it. Oh, sure you can, Mrs. Gregory. Look, it's like this. Yes, you move a little faster than I can, Jerry. And much faster than I can. Well, well I'm in. Right with you, son. And I think... Mm, yes, I've made it at last. There sure isn't any room to spare in these tin cans. You will have ample room. Now, listen carefully. The procedure is this. We will ascend one at a time. You will find a small valve directly in front of your chest. With that, you may regulate the speed of your rise. Opening the valve wider accelerates the rate of speed. When you reach the surface, open the cover of the cell as it is now. And if the water is smooth enough, you may leave them open. Otherwise, keep them closed and watch through the ports for our rescuer. Uh, suppose you go first, Joan, and show us how it's done. No, you will go first, Captain. I want you to be in a position to take charge of the rescue work with Johnson. Right, Joan. We will all close the covers of our cells. I will close mine last, so that I may open the valve flooding the submarine and opening the locks above us. You will leave first, Captain. You next, Mother. Then you, Jerry, and I will follow, after making sure the submarine is properly flooded so that it may not be easily moved from this spot. Well, here I go. Good luck, everybody. Oh, good luck, Tex. See you on top, folks. Hurry, we are losing time. Close your covers so that I may flood these locks and release us. smooth anyway. Hmm. Not a soul in sight. Tex. Is that you, Tex? Yes, Pat. Do you see anything of Johnson? Hey. Anybody else floating around here? Not so loud, Jerry. It's impossible to swim with these things. Just stay where you are for a minute. Well, where's Joan? I don't know. Did you hear that? Johnson. Over here, Johnson. Coming right up. I still don't see Joan anywhere. What could have happened? Now, take it easy. She said she had to stay a few seconds behind us to make sure the sub flooded. I'm getting worried about her, Tex. Ready to come aboard? Yes, Johnson, thanks. I'll have to hang on to the gunnel and let this steel cylinder sink out from under me as I flood it. We've got room for them here. If you want to keep one for study. Don't dare. Magnetism. Tell you all about it later. Here I come. You can reach Mrs. Gregory over the stern. And I'll swing the bow around to catch Young Hall. Go to it. Now, coming up, Pat. Can you reach the valve to flood that thing? Yes, Tex. I'm all ready. But where's Joan? We'll take care of that later. Here, here, give me your hand. Now, open that valve up. Now hang on to my hand. Ready, all? As soon as I flood this thin can. 
old tax. Back on a real wooden boat at last. And in our own friendly waters. You're all set now, Pat. But Tex, where's Joan? Hey, come here quickly. Tex, Mrs. Gregory, <gasps> get over oh, here. Tex. Please. Must have seen something. What is it, Jerry? Go for that dark spot, quick. I'll help you. What did you see, Jerry? I don't know, but something came up out of the water, and it didn't look like one of those escaped cylinders. Joan, oh, Joan. Take it easy, Pat. Here I am. Where is Joan? And she's all fine. Oh, sure she's all right. That girl can take care of herself. I'll say she can. Here, let me give you a hand aboard here, Joan. Yes, Captain. You're not hurt, are you, Joan? No, yes? Mother. I'm not hurt. But my cylinder was caught by the magnetic bombs. Hey, then how did ours get away? I released the balance of the bombs in order to ensure the stabilization of our boat. And the magnetic force spread more rapidly than I had counted on. It nearly stopped me. And you mean to say you had to get out of that cylinder underwater and come up without it? To be sure I did. Well, that's a little too close. But we're all here. How about getting back home, Johnson? Well, I think we can make about six knots in this breeze with nothing but sail. Well, get it on as fast as you can. Come on, Jerry. I can use you. No room for a crew on the small boat. Tex, do you think we'll make it to shore? Well, if Joan's right about how long those magnetic bombs will hold that other boat powerless, I don't see how we can be stopped. That other boat will be stationary for approximately two hours, and their radio will be paralyzed for an even longer time. That means we can make the shore, Tex. Even at six knots, we can make it in two hours easily. Mm, looks like we've done all right, Pat. And we owe everything, all of it, to Joan. I did only what I had been trained to do, Captain. Hmm, that Euclidean training is mighty good, whether we like it or not. It's almost too good. Well, we're on our way to the mainland. We've got all the sail up. If you don't mind, I'd like to sit back here and check up on what it's all about, Captain. I can handle the tiller from here. By all means, Johnson, sit in. Now that we have time for it, a lot of thanks for some fine work all through this. We're more than grateful, Johnson. You've been splendid. It was like the old days with the captain. I enjoyed every minute of it. Though I must admit it did look pretty black there at times. Oh, well, we've been in some mighty tight places since we left you at the same dock we're heading for now. Oh, Johnson. I'm sorry, Joan. Johnson, this is Joan. Well, young lady, I'm certainly glad to meet you. It is a pleasure, Mr. Johnson. I am very happy to meet the man who can make up code messages with the captain extemporaneously and who always has a boat in the right place at the right time. Well, not always, Joan. We came out right this time, and I'm certainly glad your mother found you. Now, if you'll excuse me, I think I'd better take charge and acquaint Johnson with some of the things we're up against and get his story on this Euclidean who located our home radio station. We'll all keep still, Tex. Go ahead. Well, in the first place, Johnson, there's another submarine down there near ours. They hung on to us with a magnetic beam, and Joan paralyzed their boat with magnetic bombs. But that won't last forever. And when they get free, we can look for trouble. Not only that, but some musical genius on the island has figured out how to transmit musical notes which will wreck those boats. <laughs> he nearly had us a couple of times. Hey, what's that noise? The boat is rocking badly. Feels like we're over a volcano. I know. Octavo has found a musical note. Our submarine is being attacked. Those are the compressed air tanks exploding. We didn't get out of that boat any too soon. Golly, Wesker! 